Hi, welcome to Tom's Dojo. I'm your host, Tom Carroll. Homemade artisan style sourdough bread with its crisp crust and aromatic creamy crumb is just about my favorite food in the whole world. Well, today I've got a recipe for you for just that kind of loaf. But even more important than that, I've got a 10 step baking process to share with you that'll make learning how to make sourdough bread a whole lot easier. Because this is a little bit more complicated, I would suggest watching the video a couple of times through and taking note of the video description down below where you'll see a list of ingredients and also a list of utensils. And then as you watch the video, just take a look at how the utensils are used in the, the kitchen tools are used in the video to make the bread and then get a feel for the flow of the bread making process. It's a bit overwhelming at first, but I promise if you put in a little bit of time and practice baking, you're going to get it down and you'll be satisfied with the results that you get. You ready? Let's get learning and baking. Step one, prepare, also known by its French name mise en place, which means everything in its place. This step is all about preparation. We read the recipe over, we make sure we have all the necessary equipment, we check the temperature, and then we get out the ingredients and we weigh them. Let's begin by feeding 50 grams of hungry starter that's been sitting in the refrigerator since last week's bake. To this, add 100 grams of water, 50 grams of whole wheat flour, and 50 grams of bread flour. That's 100 grams of water, 100 grams of flour. Stir it until there is no dry flour visible. Now there's 250 grams of starter in the jar and we'll need 200 grams for tomorrow's recipe. We'll let this starter sit out on the counter overnight at room temperature and it should more than double. Step two, mix, which means to combine the ingredients. The goals of this step are to hydrate the flour, so to make sure that all of the flour is wet and there's no visible dry flour. And this step also develops and activates the gluten as soon as the flour and the water come together. The next morning, we will mix the ingredients together. To 900 grams of bread flour in a large bowl, add 100 grams of dark rye flour. Next, add 22 grams of fine sea salt. Whisk those ingredients together. In a separate bowl, combine the wet ingredients. Seven hundred and fifty grams of water, and to that add two hundred grams of the starter that you fed last night. Notice that the starter has more than doubled in volume overnight and that it floats on top of the water, which means that it's ripe. It's filled with bubbles and ready to use. Now you have 50 grams of starter left in your jar after you measure that 200 grams out, which you'll put in the refrigerator and use it for next week's bake, just like we did today. In a large clear mixing tub with a lid, or a pot if you don't have one with a lid, add the liquid ingredients and then stir in the dry ingredients. I like to start mixing with a spatula at first and then switch to a dough scraper and a wet hand once the dough becomes too hard to stir. Cut the flour into the dough and mix until all of the dry flour is off the sides and the bottom of the tub. Let's rest that dough for an hour before moving on. This gives the flour time to absorb the water and it starts the gluten forming. 
Step three, stretch and fold. The goals of stretch and fold are to align the gluten strand so it creates structure in the dough and it strengthens that whole gluten network. And finally, it serves to degas the dough, which allows the dough to ferment longer and develop more flavor without blowing up, essentially. In this first of four stretch and fold sequences, stretch and pull the dough over on itself as you rotate the tub. Then stretch the dough straight up and give it a gentle shake and fold it over itself. In this example, I end the stretch and fold sequence by gently lifting the dough up and tucking the ends underneath to form a pillow of dough. Now I put the cover back on and let the dough rest for 30 minutes. Ready for round two. Again, perform a stretch and fold and gently tuck the dough into a ball. Notice that the dough is beginning to look smoother on the outside as it's holding its shape better. Cover and rest for 30 more minutes. In round three, the dough is feeling much softer and stretchier as you can see. I stretch the dough out to form a thin membrane to determine if the gluten is strong enough to hold its shape without tearing and thin enough to see through. Not quite. Needs another round of stretching and another half hour of rest. In round four, the dough is looking very smooth. And I can see through it when I do the window pane test. And it doesn't immediately tear when I stretch it. This gluten is looking strong. I'll let the dough rest for 30 more minutes and then we'll move on to the bulk ferment. Step four, bulk ferment, also known as the first rise. And this is when the dough is rising as a single mass. And the purpose of bulk fermenting is to get the gluten network to fill up with CO2 or to get it bubbly, the dough bubbly. This is the most important step for building flavor in the dough as it ferments. And the ideal temperature is 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, just out on the counter. If your kitchen's too cold, you can put it in your oven, not turned on, but just turn the light on. Uh, my oven reaches about 82 degrees or so in the winter time when I do that, but that works perfectly for bulk fermenting your dough. I put some tape on the side of the tub and mark the starting dough line and the line that indicates that the dough volume has doubled, so double that line. I simply let my dough bulk ferment in this covered tub at room temperature until it reaches the doubled line, as you can see here. It took three hours to reach this point. Step five, divide and pre-shape. The purpose of this step is to divide the dough into two pieces and shape it into its basic shape. This also degasses the dough so it won't blow out. This also creates tension across the surface of the dough, which helps with the spring up in the oven when it gets heated. Since I've made enough dough for two loaves, which is mostly what I do because it's just as easy to make two loaves as it is, is to make one, I like to get that economy of scale. It's time to divide it and pre-shape it. If you're only making one loaf, then pre-shape your dough and skip to the next step. Start by flouring the top of the dough and lightly dust the counter with flour. Turn your tub over the floured counter and let gravity gently release the dough. Gather the dough into a uniform shape, then cut it in half. If you don't want to eyeball that division, just weigh your dough ball and then divide by two to get the correct weight for a single ball. Pre-shape by gathering the edges of the dough into the center. The top of the dough is sticky. Flip the dough ball over once you have those edges gathered with the sticky side down onto the counter. Cup your hands around the dough ball and repeatedly pull it toward you. 
Let the friction between the sticky dough and the counter make the surface of the ball tighten up. The idea here is to create a, a smooth, taut ball. I like to flour the tops of my dough balls with rice flour or semolina flour so they don't stick to the whatever I put over the top of them. Step 6. Final shaping or panning. The objectives of this step are to give the dough its final form and to get it ready for the proofing baskets or baking pans. For the final shape and proof, I like to use rice flour or semolina flour. I liberally flour the bottom of my proofing baskets, then I shape the loaves just like I did in the pre-shape step. Step 7. Proof, also known as the second rise. This refers to fermentation after the dough has been placed in a proofing basket or in a tin. And the objectives of this step are to allow the dough to reinflate with CO2 and also to build more flavor, in our case by fermenting overnight in the refrigerator. Put the dough ball seam side up in the proofing basket. Then I add another round of tightening up the dough ball by gathering the ends and pinching them together here. I end by flouring the top and around the sides of the dough ball. When I'm finished, I cover with a reusable plastic wrap or a shower cap and place the covered baskets to proof overnight in the refrigerator. The next morning, about an hour before baking, put the Dutch ovens in your oven and preheat the oven to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Step eight, score. This is cutting or slashing your proof dough. And it has two objectives. It has a functional objective, and that is when you cut the dough, all of the hot air springs up through that uh, slash. If you don't slash it, it's not gonna rise very well when you put it in the oven. It won't have that oven spring. And it also has the purpose of identifying your dough. Certain types of bread that have maybe inclusions like raisins or olives or something have a different scoring pattern on the top. So a baker can identify it from a distance just by the score on the top. Or it can act simply like a signature to let somebody know this is this loaf was baked by this particular baker. Or the scoring can have a decorative function where you're just flouring the dough with a like a white rice flour and then doing very light cuts in the dough and where you've cut the dough it's much darker than the white flour once it's baked so it, you can produce some very beautiful designs most bakers make the cuts with a double-edged razor blade just a standard razor blade called a lom which means blade in french there are a couple types of loms one is a wooden disc that you see here that cradles the blade and it will protect your hand. And this type works really well for precision cuts, so for that decorative scoring. The traditional lom is a curved blade that's attached to the end of a, some kind of a stick. And here I show you how to make your own lom, and all I'm doing here is I'm using a, a metal chopstick and a standard double-edged razor blade. You can even use a wooden chopstick, it doesn't matter. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of scoring in this video. When you're ready to score, pull the dough from the refrigerator, cover the top with some parchment paper, and then put a cutting board on top. Turn the cutting board upside down, and it, that releases the dough from the proofing basket. And you might want to use a pastry brush or your hands to brush off any excess flour. For the first example, I use the traditional lom and I make a crescent score. This is a functional score mostly, although it creates a neat looking flap on the dough that's called an ear when the dough springs up in the oven. The idea here with, with scoring is to smoothly and confidently and quickly make the slash at about a 30 degree angle. You see, I hesitated when my blade got stuck and you can see that it, it caused a little flap in my dough. 
Next, I'm going to spray the surface of the dough with water so I can sprinkle it with some sesame seeds. So, and that will allow them to stick to the dough. Finally, I pull the preheated Dutch ovens out of the oven and I use parchment paper as a cradle to lower my dough into the pot. Now I like to spray a little water in before I close the lid to introduce immediate steam into the pot. More steam forms inside as the bread bakes in the oven. Here's the second score with the straight blade on the round handle. I make a decorative wheat stalk on the left hand side and a functional crescent shape on the right hand side. And I lower this into the hot Dutch oven and put the lid on. Step nine, bake. At this point, your oven should be preheated to 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to decrease the oven to 450 degrees Fahrenheit just before you put these Dutch ovens back into the oven. And I like to uh, manage the adding and subtracting of steam also when they're in the oven. And I do that by spraying a little, spritzing a little water into the Dutch oven and closing the pot. But if you use a Dutch oven, you really don't have to do that. It will generate its own steam. And finally, you wanna bake until it's reached the desired level of brownness. So I place both of those Dutch ovens on the middle rack of the oven and turn the heat down to 450 degrees. The loaves bake for 20 minutes with the lids on. Then I remove the lids after 20 minutes and I bake for an additional 20 to 25 or so minutes until the top is a rich brown and blistered, but it's not burned. If you find that the bread loaf isn't entirely baked when you check it, like you knock the bottom and it, instead of feeling light and hollow, it feels somewhat dense and thuddy, then you can just go ahead and put the loaf back on the oven rack and cook it outside of the Dutch oven for another five minutes or so and just watch it. Make sure it doesn't burn black. Step 10, cool, cut, and store. So as soon as the bread comes out of the oven, you wanna cool it on a rack. You cut it only after you cool it and then there's a few different ways to store it. The bread is still cooking internally when you remove it from the oven. If you listen closely, you can actually hear it crackle on the inside. It's important that you let the bread cool for at least an hour before you cut it. Otherwise, it won't cut well and it'll smash the crumb and the texture of the finished product will be anything but ideal. Around our house, we let the loaves cool. Then we cut one of the bowls or the, the round bread loaves in half and we put it uh, open face down on the cutting board and then cut that one piece up uh, one half up and use it for our sandwiches or whatever we're using it for and then we'll leave the other half on the cutting board and then we take the second loaf and cut that up and then we put them into gallon freezer bags those bread slices and pop into the freezer this way we can take the slices out directly from the freezer and put them right into the toaster or use them for sandwiches Enjoy. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this video is valuable for you and you have a delicious loaf of sourdough bread now. If you would, please subscribe and like the video if you found it useful and let us know how it turned out. Share your success with us and any questions that you might have, I'd love to be able to help out. Have a great week of baking and I'll see you next week in the dojo.